When it comes to tumor nomenclature, there are two important rules to remember. The first is that benign tumors are generally the name of the tissue plus oma. For example, a benign bone tumor is called an osteoma. On the other hand, malignant tumors end in carcinoma if they are of epithelial origin or sarcoma if they are of mesenchymal origin. Of course, there are exceptions like the fact that lymphoma is malignant. For example, let's do a quick question. Which of the following malignancies is most likely to stain positive for vimentin? Colon adenocarcinoma, squamous cell lung carcinoma, or rhabdomyosarcoma? If you remember that vimentin stains for mesenchymal tissue, then you immediately know that the answer is rhabdomyosarcoma, since it's the only one of those that's a mesenchymal tumor. Even if you don't have any idea what vimentin is or what it stains for, you can recognize that the first two are both epithelial, while the last one is mesenchymal. So if you had to guess, you might pick rhabdomyosarcoma anyway. See how easy that was? One quick word about the difference between benign and malignant tumors. When used in medicine, benign and malignant refer to a tumor's ability to grow quickly and to invade, among other things. Generally speaking, this corresponds to how likely a tumor is to cause trouble in the patient's body. But remember that there are other things that can cause trouble. For example, although most brain tumors are benign, meaning they tend not to invade, they are still quite lethal because they are growing in a confined space, namely the skull, and can compress very important structures. Before moving on to disease-specific information, let's briefly mention cachexia. This is the state of total body atrophy that's caused by chronic disease, especially in cancer. It isn't just related to poor appetite. It's mediated by inflammatory cytokines that cause derangements in metabolism, too. This is the reason why people with advanced cancer or uncontrolled AIDS are usually so skinny, frail, and weak. Cachexia is truly a sad state, and often by the time cachexia sets in, there isn't much that can be done to save the patient's life. Before moving on, let's do a mini case. Ready? A 67-year-old man presents to your office complaining of extreme fatigue, exhaustion, 30-pound weight loss, and severe back pain. Rectal exam is notable for a highly nodular prostate, and x-ray shows several lesions in the lumbar vertebrae. Question 1. What is the likely stage of the patient's tumor? If you said stage 4, you're correct. This patient probably has metastatic prostate cancer. Even without knowing any of the specifics of prostate cancer, you know metastasis is usually associated with poor prognosis and a very high stage, so the best guess is stage 4. On to question 2. On exam, which of the following structures is most likely to be atrophic? Gingival mucosa, cornea, or temporalis muscle? If you said temporalis muscle, you're correct. Based on this patient's advanced cancer and 30-pound weight loss, he's probably cachectic, and the typical manifestation of cachexia is muscle atrophy. In fact, temporal muscle atrophy, also known as temporal wasting, is a common clinical finding associated with cachexia. Great. The rest of this chapter contains information that is really important to know and is very high yield on the exam, but is honestly best learned through memorization. There are a few guiding principles which we'll talk about as we move forward, but we will not be discussing everything in detail. Please make sure you spend enough time learning these details on your own. First, there is this table that describes common conditions associated with specific neoplasms. Some of these, like Down syndrome, are genetic, whereas others, like ulcerative colitis, are chronic inflammatory conditions. The general concept here is that genetic changes, chronic inflammation, and immunosuppression can all lead to malignancy in the long run. Just to mention a few specifics, Down syndrome can be associated with acute lymphocytic leukemia, or ALL. Ulcerative colitis can be associated with colon adenocarcinoma, and states of immunodeficiency can be associated with malignant lymphomas. Now, we only mentioned a few of these. Please spend some time learning about these diseases and use this table to review them. The next table lists several important oncogenes, as well as the associated tumor and the relevant gene product. 
The important concept to remember with oncogenes is that they are genes where a single gain of function mutation leads to cancer. Most of them are receptors for growth factors, where a mutation leads to permanent activation. You might remember from our discussion of apoptosis that BCL2 is an anti-apoptotic protein. In this case, a gain-of-function mutation in the BCL2 oncogene leads to follicular and undifferentiated lymphomas due to inhibition of apoptosis. Since all of these oncogene mutations require only one allele to lead to cancer, they are typically dominant mutations. These are all very high yield for your exam, so please spend some time to learn them. The questions that you might see are usually pretty straightforward. For example, a 60-year-old man presents with fatigue, weight loss, and gum bleeding. CBC shows leukocytosis. Chromosome analysis shows a translocation of 922. Which oncogene is activated? Well, if you recognize the symptoms here as CML, you know the oncogene has to be the ABL oncogene. The flip side of oncogenes are tumor suppressor genes. These are genes that normally work to prevent cancer. If both alleles lose their function, then cancer develops, making these recessive mutations. Most of these genes are cell cycle regulators or DNA repair enzymes. Essentially, these genes are constantly working to slow down rapidly dividing cells and fix DNA mutations before they become a problem. As with oncogenes, the questions you will see are usually pretty straightforward, but remember that these are all very important to know. Just to highlight one in particular, the BRCA1 mutation is a specific tumor suppressor gene that, when mutated, has a very strong association with breast cancer. Please take time to learn these mutations. The next list is tumor markers. Again, this is something that you'll have to just sit down and memorize. Once you study the individual diseases, look back at this table to jog your memory. One important note is that tumor markers are not used as primary diagnosis. They are sometimes used to confirm a diagnosis or to track progress of tumor recurrence and response to therapy, but never as diagnosis. As an example, there has recently been some controversy regarding the PSA test and its usefulness in screening for prostate cancer. Next, let's move on to oncogenic microbes. Infection with these organisms is often associated with a particular type of cancer. HPV, or human papillomavirus, is particularly important because of the vaccine that was recently developed. And HHV8, or human herpes virus 8, is important because Kaposi sarcoma is a topic that is frequently tested on the exam. How do these infections cause cancer? Well, there are basically two mechanisms. First, viruses can insert themselves directly into the genome, interfering with proper cell division and wreaking havoc over the long term. This includes hepatitis, EBV, or Epstein-Barr virus, as well as HPV. The second way is that certain infections can lead to chronic inflammation, which increases the likelihood of cancer in the long run. This includes H. pylori and schistosoma. These are all very high yield for the exam, and again, you should use this table to review after you have studied the individual diseases.